All right, guys, so it's one o'clock and we're going to get started with the healthy habits for seniors presentation. Um, one of our COA commissioners, Don Smarto, is going to be giving this presentation. So yeah, um, it's going to be a recorded uh, presentation. So if you do not want to be in the recording, please mute yourself and turn off your camera. Um, if you're OK with being in the recording, great. We'd love to see you. Without further ado, Mr. Don Smarto. Thank you, Jacqueline. I appreciate it. Uh, a long time no see. Some of you were with us yesterday when we went to Spain. This is a little bit different. This is not a travel, but I will put in a little promo. Uh, in October, and I think it's going to be on the calendar, we're doing Italy. It's one of my favorite, favorite countries, so you'll want to join us for that. So let me give a little background of what we're going to be doing uh, in this presentation. I've done this twice before, once at the summit, and we had, oh, about 30, 35 people that were there and they seem to appreciate it. I've done it at a local church as well. And um, so I, I think uh, a good beginning is who is this for? And I would like to say for everyone, because when you talk about healthy habits, um, yes, it's important for seniors, but uh, this applies to people in their 40s and 30s and 20s and even younger. So uh, if you've got anybody in the room and you want them to join in, uh, now's a good time. So I guess my first question is, uh, who's a senior? You know, we spend a lot of time trying to define that. And if you look on the internet, you'll find different ages. What did we used to think of? Well, the retirement age was what, 65. I've known people who've retired at 60. I've known people who've retired at 50. Um, personally, I don't believe in retirement. I, I have. <laughs> no intention of stopping any of my activities unless the good Lord decides to stop me. But uh, in reality, if you go to ARP, um, they start sending you literature at 50. Now, I know people who don't want to admit their age and they will, as a result, um, not want to look at the materials, not admit their 50. In my church, the Oaks Baptist Church, I work a lot with the seniors. And uh, you know, I would say the average is somewhere between 65 and 75, some are older. And I find it an interesting phenomenon that the younger ones, by younger, I mean people who are 50 to 55, often don't join us because they think, well, I'm not really a senior. And so let's start by getting rid of the stereotypes. Senior does not mean a walker, but if you have a walker and you need it, that's fine, or uh, a cane. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean that you're senile. Uh, obviously, there's a disease called Alzheimer's, but, uh, but senior has really changed over the years because life expectancy has changed and health has changed. So uh, my best example is look at Congress, look at the Senate. You see any senators that are over 65? Uh, quite a lot. They're in their late 60s. They're in their 70s. We've had uh, senators in their 80s. Look at the U.S. Supreme Court and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So it, it's, it's really arbitrary to say that at a certain age you're, you know, uh, you're like put out to sea. That, that's not really true. Um, I, I have watched over the years great writers and artists like composers. And I'll tell you, they're still prolific into their 80s and 90s and uh, even some great scientists. So I'm, I'm a great believer. I don't know. personal theory, but I'm a great, uh, use it or lose it, you probably heard that term. Well, I'm a real believer that, um, that you really need to uh, uh, keep busy mentally. Uh, for some people, it's crossword puzzles. Over the years, with, before this COVID, I would visit nursing homes, assisted living, and what would surprise me is I would sometimes meet people in their late 80s, early 90s, who really were there because of lack of mobility but were sharp, were sharp as could be. I would also meet people, surprisingly, in their early 50s uh, who weren't functioning well. So uh, this is kind of a, a broad statement on my part, but I think if you spend a lot of time as a couch potato, and you may know what that means, just uh, sitting, watching TV, not moving, um, aging can creep up on you, well, actually overtake you, a lot faster. 
So I don't think at the outset that there's any notion that really at a certain age, you're not valuable, you're not functioning. Uh, certainly here at the summit in Grand Prairie, you will see people that are exercising into their 80s and 90s. And, and I knew a, a woman last year who um, would come and she was, she was old and she, uh, by my standard. Uh, she was in her 90s, mid 90s, and would go on the track every day. Maybe she didn't go as fast as other people. So I guess what I wanna do is uh, get rid of the stereotypes first, that aging means that you're arthritic or you're bent over. Uh, there are things that are going to happen to your body quite clearly. Uh, we have what we call built-in obsolescence. Uh, theologically, we call it the fall, meaning we weren't meant to be here forever and our bodies are not perfect. But here's the key point of this whole presentation. There are things you can do to extend your life. I found it interesting when a politician said, uh, we're talking about the COVID, that if you're past a certain age, you know, you should kind of just accept the fact that, <laughs> that you might die and, uh, you know, make room for other people. I won't say who said that. But the reality is, uh, you know, you, you may want to be a, around for a while uh, to see your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren graduate, get married. Uh, so no one's to say that at a certain age, you're not, uh, you're not entitled to quality and you're not entitled certainly to dignity. Um, and, and you know, America um, has been very different than so many other cultures. There are many cultures, especially in Asia, where they respect uh, the elderly. Uh, there are many countries in which, and I know in, in my, my parents' country of origin in Italy, where the older relative would move in with the family. They might have their own separate little area or room. Um, but, but the notion that, um, you know, that they were still very much a part of the family. And I think sometimes in America, we have used the, I know this is gonna sound political, but this is my Zoom, so I get my opinion. Um, we, we've kind of warehoused people. We, we've sent them off in some cases to a nursing home to make our own lives more comfortable. So I'll, I'll get off the political part, but I, I think you follow what, what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of what you're gonna hear is, is really common sense, uh, but also uh, I, I, I visit quite often the Harvard University medical, uh, 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 you know, uh, information that you find on the internet. And so, so a lot of my, uh, I'm not speaking as a doctor, you know, I just play one, but, but the reality is uh, this information is out there for everyone. And I would suggest this uh, with your friends, if you're a caregiver, if you know people that have neglected their health, I hope there's information here that will be useful. Uh, it, because it's recorded, uh, there will be a mechanism where you can uh, come back to it and, uh, and look at it. So I am going to uh, start our PowerPoint. Good. Okay, Healthy Habits for Seniors. Uh, you may notice under my name, it says Commission on Aging. We have a Commission on Aging uh, in Grand Prairie, and uh, we're not meeting currently because of COVID, but when we get back, uh, you are welcome. We have meetings once a month on a Wednesday. And, and again, just we'll look at the uh, Summit News for uh, details. But we have programs as well, uh, like the program that, that you're, you're seeing. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, go to church, and, and even if you don't, I think uh, the Bible is a great source of information. One of the books, 1 Corinthians, says this, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have, you have from God? You are not your own, for you were uh, bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So we're, we're told, um, even in the Bible, that uh, the body is something that, that we, we need to care for. And, it, and it's not uh, something that we should take for granted. As we know, we only get one and there's no trade-ins. So here are, here are the main areas we're gonna look at. We're gonna look at accidents, mainly accidents in the home. I'm not gonna be talking about the highways. Nutrition, important area. Exercise, I'm sitting here at the summit in Grand Prairie and exercise is a very important part of what uh, this program does. Stress, sometimes people really overlook that. And then sleep, and how important sleep is to us. So we're gonna start with accidents. Uh, here are things that people worry about, you know, when they do public opinion polls. Uh, there are a lot of people who still fear flying. I, I never really did a count, but I think I have flown 
easily over 500 times. And I've been to 16 countries, but I've been to some countries more than once. So I've done long, long journeys where I was on the plane for 18 and a half hours one way. Um, and, and I will tell you, when I first started flying, and I'm going back to 1980, uh, I was the white knuckle flyer, meaning uh, on takeoff, I, I listened to every sound and I wondered if the sounds were normal. And then of course the plane has to accelerate and go fast. So there's enough airflow under those wings to take off. And today, I mean, I get on a plane and it's probably like getting in a car. I don't give it a second thought. Actually, I do give cars a second thought because if you go on 20 or 35 at certain hours, there is a greater risk of having an accident. Uh, have you ever seen these crazy drivers who are in the far left and then suddenly realize they almost missed their exit and then go across four lanes without looking behind them? So we, we ought to worry about our highways. But no, uh, people still worry about airplanes. Uh, there are people who worry about getting hit by lightning. Well, if you go out in an electrical storm and you're holding a metal rod, you're tempting fate. And then, you know, after Jaws came out by uh, Spielberg, uh, people were afraid to go in the water uh, because fear of sharks. Uh, I don't believe there are sharks in lakes. Um, there might be. Um, I think they're mostly in oceans and salt water, but I think I've heard that sharks sometimes get into rivers. But but so here are some of the main fears that people have. The fear of getting eaten by a shark, the fear of getting hit by lightning, the fear of dying in a catastrophic uh, uh, crash. Well, guess where most accidents are? You're probably ahead of me. Accidents are in the home. There are 20,000 deaths in the United States per year. And compare that to the other three I just talked about. Only 742 deaths from airplane crashes in an average year only 70 deaths by lightning and less than 1% of sharks. So I would say, um, you know, unless you know you're going into shark infested waters, <coughs> excuse me, where you've recently heard about attacks, your greatest chance of uh, really getting seriously injured or dying is in your own home. And it comes, uh, from, from uh, usually falls. Every 18 seconds, an older adult is in the emergency room because of a fall. Now that's kind of an average out. You know, I don't know that someone is really every 18 seconds, but there might be times of day when you're not sleeping, you're not in bed, uh, where, where falls are, are more likely. Uh, one, of the, one of the big causes is footwear slipping. So that simply means if you have stairs in your home, um, um, I had a severe accident uh, and broke a leg, you're going to hear about uh, momentarily, and it was my fault, and I'll explain why it was my fault. So if you're, if you're just walking around the house, it's okay to be in slippers and in your socks and bare feet, but if you do have stairs, especially if you have carpeting on stairs, people don't realize that if you have a shoe uh, that you can easily slip out of, that can be a real cause of, of an accident. So what you're looking at is my left uh, leg bone. Uh, I don't know if you can see where the fracture is. Uh, if you look on the right-hand side, that one bone that seems to be separate, it's not supposed to look like that. Okay, that's a, that's a severe break. Where did it happen? In my house. And I missed uh, five, five stairs. So it took six months to heal. Look at this picture. Uh, some people in my church were helping me move an office and if you look at my foot, I'm wearing this gigantic boot and I had it on for about six months. And uh, let me tell you very briefly what happened. Uh, I was barefoot and I was coming down the stairs and I missed the last five steps. So I, so I toppled five complete uh, rungs of the, uh, uh, of the staircase. And um, I, I actually heard it snap. Uh, my wife was coming around the corner and I said, I think I broke my leg. And she said, no, I'm sure you're fine. And, and so I walked on it for about four or five days. <clears throat> One telltale sign is severe black and blue and swelling. And of course I went to see an orthopedic, actually an orthopedic surgeon, and we took x-rays and of course it, it was broken. Now the interesting thing is just a little side story. I would go periodically to the orthopedic office in downtown Dallas, and I, and I was sure that every month it was getting better and better and healing. And then they would take this x-ray and it wasn't quite healing. 
And I think they refer to it as like tacky, where certain cells have to congregate and, and you know, they're, they're building up the new uh, calcium and the bone. And so now it's like five months and, and I'm saying, uh, doctor, I don't understand. When I was in middle school, I was wrestling and I broke my right wrist. In fact, I snapped it in half. And I don't recall that it took more than, I don't know, maybe uh, six weeks, eight weeks, uh, and then 12 weeks to heal. And uh, uh, this is kind of funny now, wasn't so funny then. The doctor looks at me and says, and how old are you? <laughs> and, that, and that was the answer, that when we're older, we don't heal quite, quite as fast. Uh, so what had happened was, uh, being barefoot, my heel was kind of uh, smooth, and I just slipped on the stairs. And I will tell you, ever since I have a banister, I have a two-story, I use the banister, but occasionally, when I'm barefooted, my foot still slips. Fortunately, I'm holding the banister. So kind of a word to the wise. Um, if you have grandchildren that come over, toys. You never know where they're gonna be. I actually have two cats that leave objects around. Um, not as big as a toy, but, but I constantly have to be very, very careful. Let me add another thing that's very important. As a diabetic, and we talked about this uh, last month when I did a, a, a thing on diabetes, um, I have neuropathy. It took about 40 some years to get there, meaning I don't feel much of anything in my, in my feet. Uh, it's so extreme that um, if I take one shoe off, I have to look down to see if both shoes are off. Uh, so uh, there's not a lot of feeling there. Got a uh, bone infection some years ago, had one toe removed. And, and the reality was I just didn't feel anything. I didn't feel any pain. So if you have diabetes, and if you've had it long enough to have neuropathy, where it's, it's the small little nerves that go out to the end of the extremities, which would be your fingers and your toes and your feet, uh, you're more likely to fall because you're, you've lost some feeling. Uh, loose carpets, and that would be not the carpet that's gonna be nailed down on the stairs, but if you have, if you have carpet that's on wood, uh, I always recommend putting some, they sell this rubberized material you put under it, and then it doesn't move. If you simply put a carpet on wood, it's gonna move and it's gonna slip. That's another cause of accidents. Ladders, I will tell you, I don't do ladders anymore. Of course, I never liked ladders, but like when a light bulb goes out, uh, guess who changes the light bulb? Yes, my wife. Uh, if it's extremely tall, we have one ceiling that's 16 feet, then I bring an outside person in and they have a gigantic ladder if I have to ch have a bulb change. But you know what? I guess my feeling is uh, at, at this point in my life, I don't need to fall off a ladder. And I'm not exactly good with heights either. So after I get about three or four rungs up, um, I feel a little woozy. And so I'm just gonna be honest, it's not worth it. Uh, a step stool, fine, maybe one or two, but, but if you really um, are not, and, and the other thing is with ladders, the higher you go, you know, you're, you're the weight, um, there's usually a, a restriction of how high you can go. And so you've got to read that instruction. It's usually on the ladder and have somebody there to spot you, not to catch you when you fall, but to hold the ladder. Uh, other things that are really important, if you put something up on the, uh, uh, on the wall, you need to use proper anchors. Drywall uh, is not very secure. You know, you can punch through drywall with a, with a pen you can almost punch it with your fist. So unless you're using an anchor, screws themselves are not gonna hold any weight into a wall. Um, so um, when I've had to install things, I put a new large screen TV in, I just had an outside person come in. And I think it was like a hundred dollars, but I'll tell you, it was worth it. Because this guy uh, just really anchored it and put a two by four behind the TV and, and it's not going anywhere. I can almost assure you that had, had I mounted it, even if I thought I could, it still wouldn't be there. But this can be dangerous because if you're talking about heavy objects, um, such as, again, if you have uh, uh, grandchildren that come over, <coughs> you want to really make sure that it's kind of childproofed. So here's an example, if you look at this picture, where, uh, you know, children are children. They're, they're likely to do anything. And they're in inquisitive. They like to explore. So look at the dressers. 
and, and a child that puts their foot, for instance, in this picture on one drawer, and then starts to pull a top drawer, that if it's not anchored, that whole bookcase will fall on the child. And if the bookcase is heavy enough and tall enough, it will injure the child. It can, it can actually kill a child. Um, now we talk about fires. Um, this was actually a fire of a house, just a block from a church. Um, I had been at a church out in, uh, uh, let's see, Weatherford for about two years. And I saw this uh, uh, house just not, not even a half a block from the church. And then one day I arrived on a Sunday morning to see that the house had just about burned out. Um, it was uninhabitable. They eventually had to tear it down. Uh, I don't know what the cause was, but on a modern home, it will tend not to be electrical. Uh, older wiring in walls can uh, spark a short. However, if you overload outlets, like they have these multiple outlets and people think that you can just endlessly keep plugging things in, usually the circuit breaker will trip, which is good. You, know, you want, uh, you know, we don't have screw in fuses anymore. Some of you may remember that. There's a circuit breaker. There's usually a box in a, in a garage. It could be a utility room. And so when, when you're, uh, you know, if, if, something, if something wet gets in your toaster and suddenly all the lights go out, let me tell you, that's a good thing. <laughs> and don't get annoyed by it. It's protecting uh, the possibility of fire. There are over 357,000 home fires each year. And um, what, what a lot of people don't realize is what is going to kill you before the fire usually is the smoke. 2,470 deaths per year. And as you could probably guess, most people die while they're sleeping and they just never wake up. The smoke, uh, which has you know carbon monoxide in it, uh, just overtakes them, and they they just never wake up. Um, you know, if you're in a hotel, there are some people. I've talked to uh, firemen who said they won't they won't ever go on a floor higher than what it takes a ladder to get to them. That could be eight floors, ten floors, depends on what city you're in. I like to be on a high floor because I like a nice view. The truth is, the first floor is a little safer because. Um, Every hotel has carbon monoxide detectors. They have uh, smoke detectors, fire detectors, uh, heat detectors. Um, but the reality is um, you just have to be very careful of the smoke. Uh, what's uh, almost half of the causes? 45%. Cooking fires, unattended. When my father-in-law got into his 90s, we took his cooking privileges away. And I know that sounds terrible, but... Uh, he was still living alone. He had a nice little place here in Grand Prairie and he was getting forgetful. And it, it was probably the, uh, the beginning of a dementia and he, it wasn't purposeful. He simply would forget. He'd start cooking something and then, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it could start on fire. Uh, eventually something is going to, food is going to reduced to the point that it's gonna burn. There's gonna be smoke. So an unattended cooking fire. If you're a caregiver and you have a relative or you have a, a parent that lives alone, um, depending on their age and, and how uh, you know attentive they are, you wanna be very careful in the area of um, whether they're still capable of, of cooking for themselves. And it's no, it's no harm to the ego uh, to stop doing that. So electrical fires are about 15%. Uh, some people still use real Christmas trees. I don't think I've used a real Christmas tree in maybe 30 years. The problem with that, I know real Christmas trees smell beautiful, but if you ever had a, a real Christmas tree inside your home at Christmas, you know that after about a week, uh, it's not gonna keep taking water, as much water as you put at the bottom, and it gets very dry. And if you wanna know what those California wildfires are caused by, they're dry brush and trees. And so your Christmas tree can actually become something very lethal uh, if, if it gets anywhere near a spark. Um, I know most people don't smoke cigarettes in their homes anymore, but, but there are a lot of things that could spark a Christmas tree. So I guess I would recommend an artificial tree or uh, don't keep that tree real long. 
I mean, you keep it in maybe a couple days before Christmas and right after Christmas, you take it outside. Uh, heaters, these portable heaters have been known to cause uh, deaths. There were, um, you read this every year and it's really tragic, but uh, there were two boys about a year ago that um, it was cold in their room and they brought a heater in, but they brought a kerosene heater that you light and they died in their sleep. I mean, they never knew what happened to them. Um, so the, the electrical heater you plug in can still short out, but the ones that have any form of fuel, I wouldn't recommend. Candles. Candles don't cause fires unless they're unattended. And that's the problem. You tend to light a candle late at night, maybe you're sitting in the bathtub um, and you fall asleep. If the candle is only near water, no problem. But if the candle is near reading material or near a couch, um, I was superintendent of a juvenile facility and uh, our kids were locked in cells with heavy metal doors. We were told that if we couldn't evacuate the entire population, which was 60 young people, teenagers, we couldn't evacuate them in one to two minutes, uh, they would likely uh, perish. And part of that was, there wasn't furniture, but there was a mattress, which was kind of plastic. And certain couches have materials in them, like foam, that give off this toxic uh, air and smoke. And again, it's the smoke that's going to uh, result in killing you. Okay, here's the big one. I know we're here in Texas. We have what's called the uh, turkey fryer fires. So, I mean, this is real common sense, but every year uh, people die from fires caused by uh, these turkey fryers. So the first thing is not in the house. I mean, I, I, I don't really think I need to say that, but of course not in your house. But here's the big mistake people make. I've had people who open, who told me they open their garage door and they're frying in the garage. Well, I mean, that's still the part of the house. So no. Then, and the next one is not near the house. So if you've got these gallons of oil and you're near the house, this thing can explode and start your house on fire. What is the cause? It's usually too much oil or too hot a temperature. And the third one is you don't dump air frozen turkey in hot oil. Um, that is, that's an explosion. <laughs> so you need to thaw out the turkey before you do that. By state, guess what? The leading state of turkey fryer fires is Texas. You won the award. Now I'm not being gleeful here because guess what the second one is? And that's my uh, home state uh, where I came from. Illinois was the second state. And then Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York. So you can see that the northerners are just as bad with turkey fryers. This is not a southern problem at all. More die from smoke than fire. I've mentioned that. What do you need to do? Make sure that your smoke detector works. There's usually a little light. It's green. It turns red. Some of those detectors uh, buzz or have an alarm when the battery goes out. Uh, the batteries in my home drives me crazy, but they go out every year. Also, when the power goes out, for some reason, they all start uh, chiming. Now, you may find that alarm annoying, but it saves life. So the key is go through your house, make sure all the smoke detectors uh, are, are functioning. And you can see that by the green light and usually just takes the battery. Fire extinguisher, should you have in the home? Absolutely. Uh, it is recommended that you should keep a fire extinguisher. We're talking about the small kind you can hold in your hand at least 10 feet from your stove. So if you do have a fire on your oven or on your stove, you don't want to be guessing as to where the fire extinguisher is. You don't want to have to go two rooms over or in the garage. So it should be very, and it should be visible. Uh, it shouldn't be hidden in a cabinet. Uh, you know, if, if, if you think it's a, a poor site and you have a company coming over, then you can put it away. But normally the fire extinguisher should be where you could see it and 10 feet, 10 feet is, you know, uh, is pretty close. <clears throat> but here's another part of fire extinguishers. I've known people who've had fire extinguishers, the same fire extinguisher in their home for 20 and 30 years. They don't last forever. Look at the picture. There's a little gauge there. And what it's going to tell you is if the fire extinguisher, if the chemicals are still under pressure. So is it up to date? There's usually a tag. Now, the, the fire marshal will check businesses. That's very normal. And they put a tag on but the ones you have for your home, you tend not to put a tag. What I would recommend 
is that you get a magic marker and see that white label there? And you put on the label when you bought it. And so you check that date. Um, I think some fire extinguishers can last three years, four years, five years, but uh, so up to date, know the location. And I recommend having more than one for sure. And then here's one that people miss. Read the instructions on the label. Why? There are different chemicals for different fires and you got to make sure that um, the one that you have, for instance, you don't spray water on grease. You, you just don't do that. What it tends to do is it, it tends to uh, uh, overpopulate it and it starts to spread. So there's one kind for, you use foam, by the way, for grease. There's one kind for, for grease, a grease fire, one kind for paper, another kind for electrical. So uh, I know this may sound expensive, but if it saves your house and your life, uh, investing a few hundred dollars in different types of fire extinguishers is really good. I'll admit, um, how many times, this is a kind of rhetorical question, but how many times have you ever picked up something off the stove or taken it out of the microwave and the, the dish was so hot that, you, that it almost fell out of your hands? Or you picked up, um, sometimes you leave a utensil in boiling water and the metal utensil is extremely hot. Use oven mitts. I sometimes will wrap a towel, but um, I've had minor burns from picking up things off the stove and just not thinking. So oven mitts are a really, really good idea. Your fingertips are sensitive. You know, once they get a burn, like a first degree burn, even a second degree burn, it's gonna be a while before that heals. Good idea. Scalding in injuries. Well, here's what I've learned. In my house, I have different, like the sh I have two shower heads, uh, one for shower upstairs, one for downstairs. I've got several faucets and each of them seem to have different temperatures, <clears throat> which I think has to do with the proximity to your hot water heater. So for instance, my hot water heater is in my attic. So the shower head, the shower that's closest to the hot water heater gets hot really pretty fast. And the other one downstairs takes maybe a few minutes. I have one faucet that it, it instantly gets extremely hot. I would say within a minute. I have others that I have to let run for a while. So you, you have to be familiar with, with the faucets and uh, the nozzles in your home. But here's the other thing. There are controls. <clears throat> for instance, if you have your hot water heater set too high, the water coming out on the hot water side can instantly be scalding. Um, and, and certainly with a, if you're still using a bath, a lot of people use showers, but if you're still using a bathtub and you are bathing a child, a small child uh, or a grandchild, uh, obviously put your hands in the water first because you can't always see steam coming off of scalding water. So a lot of people every year get scalding in injuries because either the hot water heater is set too high and there is a control to set it down. If you can't do it, then you're gonna get a plumber or a good friend who knows anything about plumbing uh, and you can limit it so that it doesn't get, uh, get too hot. You know, if you've ever taken a shower at a swimming pool or uh, here at the summit, uh, one of the things you'll notice is that uh, the hot side will get hot, but it won't get scalding because they obviously have a, a control on it. If you have a first aid kit and you should, make sure it's updated. What should be in a first aid kit? Pretty obviously, uh, bandages, band-aids, because uh, we, you know, we cut ourselves in the kitchen, usually with a knife. Um, you know, you can put other things like uh, ibuprofen and Tylenol in your first aid kit. But the first aid kit really is for something that's urgent. So the main thing is an antiseptic, um, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, you can have, a, um, there are other over-the-counter things you can immediately put on. Because the, the biggest problem with a cut is infection. Especially, again, if you're a diabetic, infection can set in really quickly because you don't always feel it. But update your first aid kit. They, and not every item lasts forever. Recently, I had a terrible headache. I usually don't take aspirin. But I asked my wife, and we're looking through the house, and every time we found a little bottle, guess what? They were expired. Uh, they were two, three, four years. There's a reason there's an expiration date. So if you have a first aid kit, and you should, make sure that it's updated. Uh, as you get older, um, I actually have a handicap sticker for my car, which I really need to use. Now, if you would look at me, you would say, well, why does this guy have a handicap sticker? Because he looks okay to me. Well, I have what's called unsteady gait. 
Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've fallen last year. And when I was in Europe last year, I had some really bad falls because the pavement's very uneven with cobblestone. I was in uh, Monaco and I was going to take a picture and I fell into a restaurant and really banged up my knee and got really swollen. So I have what's called unsteady gait where if the parking lot is uneven, now I don't always use it. I mean, I, I can obviously walk, you know, a hundred feet. But the longer I sit, and some of you may have this problem, the more I'm not feeling my legs. And as a result, um, I can actually trip over myself. I don't have to trip on an object. I can put one foot in front of the other and actually trip. Uh, in my church, I give morning announcements on Sunday morning, and I now take the steps on the side. I'll tell you why. It has a railing. And uh, I, you know, I don't really care how it looks. I used to take the stairs at have no rally in front. Well, there were too many times that I, I almost fell and I had um, two falls. I had one fall when I was preaching one time. And again, I don't know if I tripped on a cord or my own foot. So grab bars are nothing to, to make fun of. Um, they're especially important in the shower. Um, and it's simply, uh, my father-in-law before he passed and he, he was almost 93, we put bars throughout the entire house before he moved to assisted living. They were railings in the hallway. Now he was on a scooter, but sometimes he got up. And so this is really a great investment. And you don't have to be 95 to have a grab bar. Um, if you go to hotels, you'll notice that most of the showers in hotels have grab bars because they don't want a lawsuit from somebody falling. Use a daily pill box. What does this mean? Well, <clears throat> by putting your pills and an example is the picture on the right with, it, it has the initials for the, the date, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, et cetera. Um, I have a little, I use a pill box, but sometimes what I do is when I've got like three pills I have to take at night and two pills I take later in the morning. Uh, and when I take the pill, I turn, I turn the little bottle upside down. And then the next time I take it, I put it right side up. It's a little thing that works for me. <clears throat> but look at the phrase at the bottom, double is dangerous. <clears throat> Here's what this means. Better to miss a pill than double up. So if you forget, and I'll tell you where it gets a little dangerous, it's the blood pressure medication. Because if you have a, a high dose blood pressure medication and you didn't remember you'd already taken it and you take a second one, uh, you'll get tired, but you can also get a little dizzy and get a little faint because your blood pressure is coming down. So, um, you know, again, it's just really common sense, but if you take pills or you, uh, a caregiver or someone who takes pills, um, you may, uh, especially when someone is, is really up in age and might have a, a little dementia or Alzheimer's, you dispense the pills for them or use a pill box. Very, very important thing. Check your blood pressure at home. If you don't have a blood pressure cuff at home, get one. What's the first thing when you go to a doctor's office? They take your blood, well, they take your weight first, then they take your blood pressure. The blood pressure is an indication of really what's going on inside your body. And it doesn't take long to do it. Uh, they have the kind you can put on your cuff. Um, and, and I have one of those, but actually the one that goes on your upper arm is, is a little better, a little more, it'll cost more, but it's really a very good thing to have. A couple of weeks back, I went to see a doctor and my upper blood pressure was uh, like 250. And then a couple days later was still around 270. That, that's really, really bad and dangerous. Well, it turned out that, um, and now it's been normal. I, I take it every day. It's been absolutely normal. Well, I had had a colonoscopy and you drink this drink, which is endless. I mean, I don't know how many gallons it is. <clears throat> and one of the ingredients is sodium chloride, sodium salt. And that drove my blood pressure up. So when, once we figured out what it was, then we got it back to normal. Uh, so if your blood pressure is dangerously high, what do you do? You call your doctor. Uh, don't, don't be your own doctor with blood pressure. Really important. For a diabetic, test frequently. Now I'm showing you a picture of something I don't use anymore. I'm wearing a Dexcom. Some people wear Freestyle. There's different brands. But I wear a device on my stomach that measures interstitial fluid, that is my glucose level, every five minutes. And you set the parameters for alarms. So if I'm going too high, for me, it's one over 185, goes too low, under 70. If I go under 50, then the alarm gets louder. Uh, but for a diabetic, you must test frequently. And I think if you did 
um, if you joined my diabetic uh, Zoom. I wasn't real good at this years ago, and I'm going back 30 years, where I was guessing what I was. And uh, I didn't guess well. Uh, and as a result, <clears throat> lost a lot of sight in one of my eyes, my right eye. I've had over, I think, 18 laser surgeries now on one eye, uh, and then the other eye as well. As I mentioned, I had a, um, a minor amputation. So um, uh, testing is really important. Again, if you're a caregiver, uh, you can easily test for the person or, or anyone can wear this Dexcom. And by the way, you can, you can pair it with Bluetooth, which is your phone, and share it. So for instance, if you have an elderly relative or parent that lives alone, and they're wearing a device that measures their glucose, that information can be transmitted to your phone, even if you're 10 miles away, so that you can keep tabs. It's a great thing. You can also share it with, with your doctor. Um, this is true. Four Dallas area pastors died of massive heart attacks in the last year. Uh, that's pretty sobering. Now, you know, there are lots of reasons for heart attacks. And um, one of the things that, that, and we'll talk about survival in just a minute, um, sometimes it's genetic. In my case, it's, it's genetic. I've had a cardiac cath. I'm considered a heart patient, but really I'm doing quite great. Every time I do a stress test is where you get on a treadmill and they get your heart rate up. I'm, I'm passing it with flying colors. I had a stress test of early January, doing fine. Just had an EKG two weeks ago, doing fine. Uh, but the main reason I'm vigilant is that every male in my family had a heart attack before the age of 60. My father died at 52 from a heart attack. Uh, uh, my brother uh, died of a heart attack. So a lot of it is, gen like with diabetes, a lot of it's genetics. You can be predisposed to heart disease. There are people, one of my, uh, my cardiologists told me several weeks ago that he had uh, gotten calls from four men that had, had, a, had heart attacks all on the same day. And they were 35, 40, 42, and 45 years old. So don't think they only happen to old people. Uh, and with COVID, by the way, <clears throat> we're getting to realize that we don't know how it affects everybody. It affects people in different ways. We know that some people don't seem to get sick at all, <clears throat> although they can carry the virus. In other cases, uh, a heart attack can be related to the COVID virus as well as stroke. So survival, you have this on your screen. Obviously we need food, we need water, and we need oxygen. They're essential for life. But take a look at, at, at this. You can survive without food for three weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, that's not fun, but you can't survive for three weeks without food. You can only survive about three to four days without water. You gotta be hydrated. Your cells need water. Um, I, when before the COVID, I would visit hospice patients a lot. And I currently know some people that are in hospice. Well, when I hear from the family that they haven't taken any water and they have no IVs in hospice, basically it's just comfort. When I hear that people are no longer drinking water, I usually know they have about three or four days left. Oxygen, you only got about three minutes. <clears throat> so if somebody, if you see somebody at the bottom of the pool and for some reason they fainted or they're unconscious, get them out of that pool as fast as possible and do CPR. Because after three minutes, you've got brain damage. So um, the, the sad thing is when people have lost consciousness in their own home and they live alone, uh, once you're deprived of oxygen, um, even if they resuscitate you, uh, you may never uh, be the same again. <clears throat> now we talk about the word stress. I can induce stress in you uh, in the next couple seconds. You know how I can do that? Um, by asking you now to imagine you have received a letter in the mail from the IRS and you open it and it says you're being audited. Any stress there? <laughs> I've had that happen and uh, it's not pleasant. Uh, we know that uh, with the IRS, they're not terribly patient. I, I did, uh, my, my, one of my doctors, I got so many doctors I've lost count. I think I have 11 or 12. You know, everybody specializes now. So if you say you have an ache in a joint, you see an orthopedic, uh, the heart cardiologist, uh, the endocrinologist deals with uh, endocrine, which is diabetes. 
and um, you might have a digestive doctor who would do the colonoscopy. Well, obviously I have an eye doctor, an eye surgeon. <clears throat> so now you end up with like uh, 10 or 11 or 12 doctors. And I have this one doctor that always asks me in every physical, do you have any stress? To which I always laugh. Uh, well, it is funny, isn't it? How can you live in society in this world without stress? We all have stress. Um, even with the COVID, when we were locked into our homes, and <clears throat> I was home in March and April and part of May. Um, I, you know, I, I was doing fine. I wasn't going anywhere and we were eating. So we were very fortunate, but you know, what was interesting? I had what was called COVID dreams. I don't uh, well, nightmares. I don't know if any of you had those, uh, with listening to too much news and hearing about the death rates going up in New York, uh, and then just worrying. I mean, a package would come to the door from Amazon and we would, we would spray it and, and wipe it with Lysol and leave it outside for three days. I, I don't do that anymore, but you may remember those days. So stress is a part of life. If you are alive, unless you're in a coma, you got stress. Uh, what's the biggest stress maker? Well, I'd say it's health, uh, followed certainly by bill, by bills. If you're on a fixed income and you look at all the bills, you know, you can't always control the utility bills. Yes, you can turn every light off, but uh, there are basic utility bills. <clears throat> when I built my home in Grand Prairie, we put in a gas fireplace. I thought, wouldn't that be lovely? And we'll just put on that fire and kind of look at it, you know, for months and months, especially in the winter. Haven't used it probably in about 10 years. You want to guess why? Well, if company comes over, if my son visits from Chicago on Christmas night, we put the fireplace on. Main reason is, Gas is extremely expensive. And so when I started seeing the bills of letting the fireplace run for 10 hours a day, <clears throat> I stopped <laughs> using the fireplace. They have these electronic fireplaces, by the way. I have a DVD of, of a fireplace that I put on my TV. So now at Christmas, we watch the fire on TV and you hear the crackling sound. So stress is something we all live with. So, so how to deal with stress? <clears throat> uh, psychologists will tell us that short-term stress is good. Uh, there's a response called fight or flight. Well, let's give you a good example of stress that's good. If there is a fire in your house and your house is filled with smoke and suddenly wakes you up and you start crawling, which is what you want to do. You don't walk, you crawl. You feel a door if it's closed to feel if it's hot or not. Hopefully there's another exit, but you're moving really fast. You're in a crisis situation, there's a fire, you've got to get out of danger. And so there are chemicals in your body like adrenaline that spark you, that's good stress. You wanna get away from the danger. If somebody uh, in, a, in a dark parking lot at Walmart looks suspicious or is coming toward you, um, you wanna feel that stress so you can, you can uh, get in that car quickly and lock your, your, lock your doors. <clears throat> now, the body reacts to stress. This is built in. I mean, this is the way God created us. Um, police officers who, who almost daily get into dangerous situations, and I've got several friends that are police officers, especially in a chase, not only a high-speed chase with cars, but sometimes it's a chase on foot. And I've got a, a good friend, Justin. I won't use his name because this is public, but he's had to do a lot of uh, foot chases. And now he's in great, excellent condition but you have a, heart, a rapid heartbeat. Uh, this is the body, this is automatic, by the way. You're gonna need more blood. So the body just kicks in and that heartbeat increases. And you know, people will say, well, I felt my heart was coming through my chest. Well, it doesn't do that. But you're needing that extra blood flow because especially you need that extra blood flow to your brain so that um, you can be really uh, alert. Your muscles tighten up. Um, you know, when you were a kid, did you ever play where you wanted, you asked somebody to punch you in the stomach, but you tightened up beforehand so it didn't hurt as much? Well, they do that naturally when you have stress. And that's kind of just like, it's the body's own suit of armor. It's just protecting itself. Um, you know, if you were in a near car crash or you saw a car in front of you spin, you can't control those automatic responses. And one of the things you'll feel is you just tense up. And uh, this is an interesting note, side note about auto accidents. People who were asleep or very relaxed, unfortunately, like with alcohol, 
who got in a major accident survived it more than the people who tensed up. I guess from what I've read, it has more to do with the body being limber, but in being so tight, if your body goes through or hits the windshield, it's gonna be more, more damage. Dilated pupils, uh, people who have stress, uh, again, this is uh, built into the body. If, a, if an enemy is coming toward you, like a grizzly bear, um, your eyes have to get really wide so you can see. Um, now, your field of vision narrows. Um, you don't see peripheral as much, but they dilate. They open really wide so you can see what that danger is. And, and especially at night, if there's a fire in your house, you want your eyes to be able to take in as much light as possible. Uh, you're going to hyperventilate when you have stress. You take a lot of little short breaths. Uh, when you hyperventilate, uh, you're, you're breathing shallow and you're um, breathing fast and you can actually pass out from hyperventilation. I was a security guard many, many years ago and um, I wasn't a very good security guard. Well, I, I guess the companies that I guarded didn't for the most part get robbed. So I was good from that standpoint. I had to stand in a bank lobby for a couple months and the bank never got robbed while I was there. So I would say I was effective there. But when I say I wasn't so good, they didn't really train us really well. And one time I was in a warehouse and um, a guy came in holding a pipe. He was gonna hit me with the pipe. What I didn't know was there were two brothers who owned the company. One brother hired the security firm, didn't tell his other brother. I'm there after midnight. I'm going through the building with a flashlight. The brother happened to be driving past the building. He sees a light. He assumes it's a burglar. He had the key. So he comes in and he's gonna hit me with a pipe. And, um, and, you know, when you're a security guard all alone, you're not wearing a uniform. So I looked like an intruder. I did have a gun, which unfortunately they had not trained me in. I had never even fired the gun. So let me tell you, unlike the James Bond movies where, you know, somebody is totally relaxed and they take out a gun. Here's what they hadn't told me. I was shaking. The, the stress was so uh, tremendous that I'm not sure I could have even shot the guy because my, my hand was shaking. Uh, fortunately, he eventually put the pipe down. I put the gun down. It could have been a very bad situation. But afterwards, my heart was still racing. Uh, I was totally wet with perspiration. But these are things the body just does. So the body releases two chemicals, adrenaline and cortisol. This is good when you have a crisis and you need to act quick. Uh, if you have a, a loved one who's suddenly sick, your body's going to kick into alertness. You've got to call 911. You have to move maybe a person's body. You have to do CPR. You want these chemicals to act. Now, here now uh, comes the downside of stress. This is where stress can ruin your health. Long-term stress. See, short-term stress is the crisis. You get out of that house in 30 seconds because there's a fire. Because it increases your blood pressure and keeping your blood pressure high is unhealthy. Uh, Long-term stress has been linked to disease and cancer. You can have jaw and teeth problems. Uh, mostly in your sleep, you're grinding your teeth. A long-term stress could lead to overeating. You know, we call it comfort foods for a reason, don't we? Uh, one time, my wife was in another city, and you know haagen ice cream. It was my fla favorite flavor, which was coffee-flavored, and it wasn't the sugar-free. It was the dangerous stuff. And I thought, well, I'm just going to have a little bit. And so I had like a spoonful. It was delicious. And I got to tell you, the stuff with the sugar is better than the stuff without the sugar. Um, but you got to watch your health. And um, I actually put it back in the freezer. And then I took it back out of the freezer and I had a couple more bites. Well, as you can probably imagine, I ate the whole pint, which I should not have. And then I hid it. I put it at the bottom of the garbage. My wife comes back from out of town. By the way, she found it in the garbage because she was looking for it in the freezer. And um, I wasn't punished, but you know, there was a little conversation we had. Uh, Long-term stress can lead you to overeating because of the stress. You're trying to comfort yourself. Um, headaches, um, migraines can come from long-term stress and it can weaken the immune system. <clears throat> and in this age of COVID-19, you do not want a weakened immune system. So results show that people who feel stressed are 27% more likely to develop heart disease or die from heart disease. Uh, <clears throat> there are ways to reduce stress. So let's just talk about those. Uh, one of the things uh, we do is recreation. Um, <clears throat> you know, not everybody can be on a stationary bike. I understand that. 
not everyone can be on a treadmill. But I say this to people of all ages, whether you are 60 or 80 or 90, keep moving. Uh, the couch potato is not good. And that's someone who sits in a, in a lounge chair all day eating salted popcorn and watching TV. You can do that once in a while. <coughs> but if you do that on a steady basis, your health will decline. Keep moving. Walk around the house if, it, if you can't get outside. Uh, at the summit in the back, there's a beautiful pathway that goes around a pond. Uh, people walk on that track. I know my friend Gary walks on that track. Keep moving. If you're at an age where you can still bicycle or run, do it for sure. But guess what? Fast walking is as healthy as running. Studies have shown that. You have these mall walkers, you know, almost every mall. And when the COVID finally we get a vaccine, the malls will open earlier. The shops aren't open and they let uh, people, especially seniors, uh, do what we call power walks because the malls have long stretches. You might want to keep that in mind. Um, you can obviously walk around your neighborhood, but you've got curbs and curb cuts and you have possibility of dogs. Um, so keep moving. Recreation, very important, reducing stress. Laughter is a great reduction in stress. You may notice that I have a sense of humor. I, I hope from time to time that you notice. And uh, when I talk with my son, we, 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 it's more satire. We're not telling knock knock jokes, but we kind of make fun of life and, you know, and I make fun of myself. I think that's the best kind of humor. I, I, I'm not perfect and I make little mistakes <laughs> from time to time. Uh, I have to tell you one that uh, my wife did recently. We, uh, we came home. Um, I don't believe she's watching right now, which is why I can tell the story. And I think she'd be good, good humored about it. But last week we were coming home and uh, it got dark. So we got in the driveway of our Grand Prairie home and I heard her exclaim, she was driving, oh, look, oh, look. And I'm looking, I don't, it's dark, I don't see anything. And she said, look, there are puppies. There are puppies in the street. And I thought, where, where? Uh, I've seen some stray dogs. There, there's two little dogs that my neighbor have and they kind of run wild sometimes. Um, but she said, no, 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 these are beautiful little puppies. and and. So she opened the car door and started calling them. And uh, apparently the puppies got, got really close until she realized they were raccoons. <laughs> it was a whole family of raccoons. I think at last count there were five and we did not want them in our automobile. Um, and yes, they were small, but I, yeah, I don't know if they have rabies or they can bite or what. So, uh, and we laughed about it. Then I told my son the story we laughed about. Laughter, see, this is laughter on yourself. It's not making fun of somebody else. It's not ridiculing somebody else. Uh, I, I personally detest, detest politics right now. Uh, I'll tell you, one good way to reduce stress is stop watching the news. I honestly mean that. <clears throat> you could read the news on the internet. But if you watch cable news, they repeat the same story over and over and over again. And let's face it, right now in the political season, it's all rancor. It's all anger. <clears throat> People are shouting at each other. People are putting each other down. This is not a political statement. I'm not endorsing <clears throat> Republican, Democrat, Independent. <clears throat> what I'm saying is a steady diet of the news right now is really not healthy. Uh, you can catch up quickly. And then, you know, there was a day I would watch the COVID statistics every day, especially when New York and New Jersey were really high. Well, I would watch the same story maybe 20 times a day. That's not good for stress. So laughter is good. Uh, reduce the watching news on TV. Certainly reduce caffeine and sugar. And uh, we're, we're gonna come back to that. Stop smoking. Now this one would seem a no brainer. Like everybody should stop smoking. Uh, when I travel to Europe, uh, people smoke in Europe and I don't understand that they have a longer life expectancy, but I'll tell you the reason is, even as much as smoking is unhealthy, we know that, <clears throat> the other part is that they walk a lot and because of all the walking and good nutrition, it kind of offsets. Uh, so they do still are healthier than us, even though some of them smoke, but, um, and vapors, uh, the word is not totally in on the vapors, but I'm going to tend to think let's err on the side of don't do it. Don't have your teenagers doing it. We don't know, you know, you're still breathing a warm chemical and you don't know what all those chemicals are. It's just not normal. You wouldn't put your mouth near a tailpipe 
of a, of, of, a, of a car, would you, when the car's on? So stop smoking. Volunteerism, uh, it's something I've done for years and years and years. I'm on the Commission on Aging. I, I, I enjoy it, I love it. Prior to that, I was on the library board for 10 years. How much did I get paid? Zero. Well, you see, not everything in life is connected to money. And when you help other people, I don't know if you know this, but Grand Prairie is doing something wonderful. We have a new program in which there is an incentive for the city employees once a month for, I believe, half a day, they get their pay for doing community service, volunteerism. Isn't that a wonderful concept? They might mow somebody's lawn who, who can't afford it or can't do it. They might build a ramp on somebody's house who is wheelchair bound. But volunteerism in so many ways is healthy. When you give to someone else, it really is good for you. It's reciprocal. And we call it paying it forward. Uh, I mentioned in a, in a story I told last week that my wife and I went to a subway. First time we'd gone to any restaurant and um, we ordered two sandwiches. Doesn't take much to get up to $18. When we got up there, the gentleman said, no, the man in front of you paid for your meal. And he was a young man and I went outside and I couldn't find him. But, you know, it made me feel so good about people. We read all this uh, news about strife and riots and protests. And this was a total stranger. And he was, we, as I recall, he, we was, he looked like he was in his early 30s. I don't know what motivated him, but obviously my immediate response was, I need to do this for someone else. And so I'm just waiting for that opportunity when um, I'm standing in a line in, in, our, in a fast food restaurant uh, and, and I will pay for the person in back of me. Uh, that's, that's a very good thing to do. And it really reduces stress. Breathing deeply. I know Lily, who uh, represents the art, has talked about this many, many times. We don't really breathe very deeply. See, we don't even think about our breathing. We just do it. It's automatic. But the reality is that sometimes we breathe very shallow. <clears throat> and so right now, I, you don't, you're not seeing me, but you're hearing me. I would say, uh, take a deep breath and, and a, a real long, deep breath, and then let, hold it. And I have to keep talking so I can't hold it. So hold it one, two, three, four, five. Now slowly exhale. Now, if you did that 10 times in a row, I will tell you that really that will in, in increase uh, the oxygen level in your, in your bloodstream, which is really good. Um, I have been swimming a lot. And so I have to take really deep breaths, especially if I'm under the water. Um, but I've learned to, to breathe deeply. It helps a lot. Listening to music, uh, I think, really reduces stress. And by the way, it, it can be any kind of music you like, except acid rock. I'm sorry, for you, for you people who were big fans of that in the 70s, I think when it sounds more like noise than music, okay, that's my opinion again. Um, if you're listening to that crazy kind of acid rock where it sounds all electronic, uh, I'm not sure that's going to relax you. It might for some people, for some young people. But I'm talking more about, of course, I'm, I'm an older person. So uh, Montevani, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, that, that was my era. I love classical music. Uh, when I'm writing, I was writing last night till 2 in the morning. Uh, no, 3 in the morning. And as I was writing, I was listening to a symphony. And uh, it, just, it just helped my mood. Um, Beethoven gets a little agitated, but Mozart is very tranquil. Um, Rachmaninoff, very tranquil. Um, there's just beautiful, beautiful music um, that can reduce your stress level. Use earbuds, use uh, um, you know, earphones. Uh, and listen to the kind of music you enjoy. If it is country and Western, then, then listen to it by all means. If it's operatic or classical, listen to that. But whatever your favorite music is, that will reduce stress. And finally, uh, you want to be positive about life. You want to be thankful. You want to be grateful. You know, you've heard this phrase, is the glass half empty or half full? And you have people who are cynics, who whatever they look at, they always think the worst. Uh, my mother, I, I love my mother dearly, but she tended to be negative. And we took her on vacation one time. This was not a good experience for us because she just tended to see life that way. One day we were in Gatlinburg, uh, I think it's Tennessee, and we were driving, it was a beautiful day. And uh, we, were, we were on a big highway 
there were mountains in front of us. We were headed for a tunnel. And, uh, and so I said to my mother, she was in the front seat next to me, isn't it a beautiful day? To which she responded, straining her eyes, I think there's a dark cloud on the horizon. <laughs> See, she had that way of always looking for something bad. By the way, as we approached the tunnel, she nearly panicked. She was convinced the mountain was going to fall on us. Now, I don't know how she got like that. I have a guess that her mother was like that because from the time I was very small, if I was going outside in the rain, she would tell me I was going to be, get hit by lightning. Uh, I, I didn't learn how to swim. Guess what? Till I was 40, almost, well, I think maybe 45. I, I didn't teach myself, but I took lessons at the YMCA. You know why I didn't swim all those years? Because my mother told me that if you swim, you drown. So it was always, you know, kind of the, the negative side. So being positive, being thankful about life, being grateful is a great stress reducer. Someone once said, I'm not arguing, I'm just explaining why I'm right. <laughs> um, sleep, this is an important one. Again, we overlook this. We think we can cheat on sleep. Uh, we cannot. <clears throat> Someone, people said, follow your dreams, so I went back to bed. I'm throwing a little few jokes in here for you. So what you don't know can't hurt you. That's false. What you don't know can hurt you. I did this in my diabetic presentation and I'm doing it related to sleep. So how much sleep do you need? That, that's a question that's asked quite a lot. We know that infants and newborns need a lot of sleep. The body is accelerating growth. And so as you know, uh, a newborn uh, can sleep uh, most of the day uh, upwards of 17 hours. I have two cats who I believe sleep 20 to 21 hours a day. Now, I don't know if it's really deep sleep. Um, I, I've had dogs too, and you can tell when they're running in their sleep and their paws are moving. But the cats, if you notice, if you whisper, one ear turns very quickly. They're always really on high alert. So we call them cat naps because they really are that. It's not that deep sleep that a human needs. But if you look at that chart, um, you know, as we get older, we don't seem to need as much, but still look at those teenage years. There's a lot of teens, I know I did when I was a teenager, uh, that, you know, try to sleep only four hours a night or five hours a night. Look at the chart. This is recommended by um, the Harvard Medical School. Uh, you're a teenager, 14 to 17. You still need eight to 10 hours. Now, then you go to the 65 and plus. Look, you still need seven to eight hours. Do I cheat sleep? Yes, I do. Do I pay for it? Yes, I do. Um, what happens is, I do all my writing after midnight. And the main reason is because I'm not getting interruptions. Nobody's calling me on the cell phone, so I get more done. But I still need that sleep. So there are days that if I go to sleep at three in the morning, I may not wake up till nine or 10. You still need an adequate amount of sleep. Now there's something called sleep debt. And, and these are um, misconceptions about sleep. You do not catch up on your sleep. So if you, if you are back in an office and you're tired during the day, and let's say you're averaging four to five hours of sleep, and then you say, what is the phrase? I'll catch up on my sleep on the weekend. Uh, that's a falsehood. You don't. The body doesn't suddenly on a Saturday morning replenish any harm you did during the week. So there's no such thing as catch up. The next thing is uninterrupted sleep. Once you go to sleep, uh, I don't have this on the screen, but the recommendations are the room should be cool, the room should be dark, pitch dark if possible, and no, you shouldn't be watching TV or looking at a computer screen. Uh, sometimes people will take a tablet to bed. Uh, there, there's blue light that comes that interferes with your brain because it tells your brain that it's really daytime. And so the serotonin levels change and therefore you have a harder time going to sleep. So if you really want to go to sleep, well, now some people say I lay there and I can't go to sleep. You can do something like a, a hot beverage, but not hot tea because the caffeine is going to keep you awake. People think that alcohol, a little, little uh, bit of wine will make you go. Actually, no, alcohol does the opposite. It, it, it interrupts your sleep. <clears throat> Uh, and then, you know, we you know what daytime fatigue is, obviously. Now, uh, 
there were days I remember years ago, I was in my thirties and I would fall asleep at my desk. Um, I, I had kind of a high pressure job where I had meetings all day and I had a lot of deadlines, I had a very big budget. I had a budget of a million and a half dollars and I had a staff. So, so obviously I had to be, I had to be really alert, but sometimes at home I was taking work home and I was still working uh, in the, into the wee hours and not getting enough sleep. And I actually would nod off at my desk. Uh, we, we have a term now. Um, somebody said I could be a morning person if morning happened at noon. I like that one. Um, chronic snoring. You know, we, we make so much fun of this. We have made this into a joke. In so many movies, it was a movie with John Candy, and he was, you know, he was snoring. Well, snoring, which is really a deprivation of oxygen, because in the back of your throat, your, your, your tongue or your palate, kind of closes off, it's a strain on your heart. Lack of oxygen affects the brain. Low oxygen in the blood is not good. Um, chronic snoring disrupts sleep and, uh, and you have fatigue. Weight, I did not snore. I was dreaming I, a motorcycle, <laughs> someone once said. So now we have something that we didn't talk about 40 years ago, we have sleep apnea. It is now listed as, I don't know if it's listed as a disease, but it's a condition. It's that condition where during your sleep, your body is waking itself up because it's gasping for air. And, it's, and chronic snoring is a symptom of it. And the antidote is a face mask. And uh, some are nasal, but if you have a serious condition, you have to wear a full face mask. Um, and I know people who have apnea. Uh, one person I know who has apnea is me. And uh, how did I know I had it? Well, aside from the fact that everybody in my life told me I snored, my wife, uh, I would travel with college students years ago. I'm going back to the 1980s and 90s, and students would run to the drugstore to buy earplugs if they were in the same room with me. I had one student once who was in, you know, we had double beds, he was in the other bed, and I woke up in the morning, he was missing. And I thought, well, he must be outside for a walk or a jog. And he had brought his blanket into the bathroom and was sleeping in the bathtub with his pillow there. Um, so that was kind of a, um, a wake-up call for me that my snoring was extreme. And uh, now how did I know recently that I needed to see a pulmonologist? Well, because I was falling asleep at traffic lights. This occurred about four years ago. If you remember, I said I was pastoring a church in, uh, in Weatherford, and that's about 90 minutes. And when I got off the highway and, and the light turned red, I would fall asleep at the light. And this could be like noon. And then how did I wake up? Well, people would be hunkering their horns because the light had turned green. So that was the time to see the pulmonologist. And he said that I had one of the worst possible sleep apneas. And there were only two solutions. One was surgery, which is painful and doesn't always work. And the second one was to wear a device. And I opted for the device. Confusion. Sometimes I don't know whether I found a rope or lost my horse. Um, I have to constantly put my keys in the same place. I can't tell you how many times I've said to my wife, where did I put the car keys? So <clears throat> what I do now, and maybe you have a system, um, I, I put my house key, which I have several keys at night in my front door, obviously not on the outside. And then I attach my car keys to them. So in the morning, if I need to go somewhere, the keys are right there. And that's, that's, that's a, a good device. So <clears throat> shallow breathing, we've talked about that. It can cause indigestion, cardiovascular disease, and it can even cause depression. So breathe deeply and slowly. You know, when people are in rehab, see that little machine there? One of the things that respiratory therapists do is they have you breathe into a machine, there's some water with a, a little ball or a chemical, and you have to get it to a certain level. That just forces your lungs to get better and better. The greatest problem with COVID right now is it attacks the lungs. And, uh, and we know that one of the symptoms is people have real difficulty in breathing. Uh, many elderly people die of pneumonia. Uh, if you haven't had a pneumonia shot, I, I, and you're not afraid of vaccines, I'd recommend it because um, people who, are the, who get to an advanced age, pneumonia can really, really be a killer. So uh, it, it helps with mental alertness, it relaxes your muscles, removes toxins, uh, actually. 
Nutrition, this is an important one. This is gonna be my last big area. So uh, you are what you eat. Now, that could be scary, right? Because <laughs> if you go to McDonald's every day, there was a famous uh, movie called Supersize Me. If you've not seen it, it's a documentary. I think it's still available on Netflix. And Supersize Me was a guy who decided to eat nothing but McDonald's for 30 straight days. Now, you may think this is funny, but in the documentary, supersize means you, you increase the size of everything. You have a, a Big Mac, you make it a bigger Big Mac, uh, a, a extra large fries, extra large Coke, not diet. Well, you know what happened to him? Uh, he survived, but he nearly died. He went to the doctor's office after about three weeks of only McDonald's, his, his blood pressure, his, his, his vital signs were, were crazy. And the doctor literally said, you are going to die. And, and one of the big things was the French fries. In the film, they do an experiment where they take a potato and put it under a bell jar. They took, they took uh, you know, fries from a, a good restaurant. I'm implying that McDonald's is not a good restaurant. And they put it under a bell jar. And then they put a McDonald's fries. This was in the film. So as you can guess, within a week, the potato had gotten rotten and had dark spots and the fries had shriveled. And, and guess what? The McDonald's fries were perfect. They did not lose their beautiful yellow color. And a year later, they still look normal. What does that tell us? It tells us that it's so saturated with chemicals that in your body, it can be lurking somewhere. Someone once said, a party without cake is just a meeting. Now, I've said this before, you can cheat if you control your cheating. Now, let's talk about salt. This is an important one. You only need three grams of salt a day. You do need salt. You need sodium. People pass out a faint, especially in the summer when they're working outside and, and they're perspiring a lot. Why? That's why uh, football players and, and, and uh, others use uh, like Gatorade because it has sodium in it. It has salt. And, and you do need salt for the contraction of muscles. You need it to transmit uh, nerve impulses. One of the things I think you're seeing is this balance. The body is so beautifully made, but there's this balance. No salt, and you can faint and pass out, and it's really dangerous. Too much salt, and we'll show you in a moment, and then you've got things like high blood pressure. So this is from the Harvard Medical School, the dangers of too much salt. Um, I have a, a, a person I know who, um, when in the past, when we went to a restaurant and the meal came, he immediately took the salt shaker and just started shaking vigorously. And I mean a lot of salt that lasted for 30 seconds. The thing that I always found interesting is he hadn't tasted the food yet. I guess he just assumed he needed salt. Well, a word to the wise. Uh, first of all, if you go to a restaurant, they already use a lot of salt. In fact, they use probably too much salt. And salt is added to a lot of foods, including cereals, because it improves taste, but too much salt, high blood pressure. What does high blood pressure do if it stays high too long? Stroke, um, kidney damage, your kidney filters. It can only take so much sodium and you can have irreparable kidney damage. Uh, too much salt can lead to a stroke, to heart disease, to stomach cancer, and uh, certain types of kidney stones. Um, I, I've had a lot of things that I wish I didn't have. One of them was kidney stones. I was in a New York hotel preparing, I was dressing and preparing to speak uh, at an important engagement and somebody entered my hotel room and stabbed me in the back. Well, they actually didn't stab me. I thought somebody stabbed me in the back. Uh, if you haven't had kidney stones, I hope you never have them. Uh, I don't even wish them on my wor worst enemies. And, you know, I have wished things on my enemies, but <laughs> kidney stones is not one of them. And I will tell you because it is excruciating and it's something you absolutely do not want. So this is a picture of me in a town called Perusia in uh, central Italy. I brought my son. We were going through, I think, uh, 10 or 11 cities in Italy. Wonderful trip. And this guy was grilling corn. If you've ever had grilled corn at the state fair, or you can do it yourself at home, uh, it, I think it just, it tastes delicious. And now I don't really speak Italian. So uh, he asked me, or I thought he asked me if I wanted extra butter. And, uh, and you know, I do like butter. And um, when I go to the movie theater, you know, I tend to put butter or whatever that spray is on my popcorn. And so, uh, yeah, so I, you know, I, I shook my head and smiled. 
Well, that isn't what he asked me. He didn't ask me if I wanted extra butter. He asked me if I wanted extra salt. And the first bite, this is a picture my son took. I mean, I just cringed. <laughs> it tasted awful. I have no idea how much sodium he put on it. Um, so here's one of the things I've learned to do. Look at labels. If you don't do that, start doing it. My wife is very good at this. She looks at labels. Uh, she looks at, there's, there's one guy who goes to food stores and he picks up labels and he explains them to you. And he explains that, that the first ingredient is the, high, is the one that has the most content. <coughs> and they don't always mean what you think. So for instance, even when a food says natural flavors, it's not always natural. And, and if your first ingredient is high fructose, yeah, it sounds like it comes from fruit, but no, it's not good. It's kind of like cane sugar. This is a, a can, a real can of Campbell's soup, cream of celery. Uh, I happen to like that flavor, but let me tell you, look, look at the sodium, 850 milligrams. Do you remember how much you need? Three, three. So um, start looking at the salts and you will find reduced salt labels. Some people say, you know, they don't like the taste, but you will get used to it. And if you have a steady diet of packaged food, packaged food is um, TV dinners. Packaged food is anything that's frozen because they have to preserve it and they preserve it by adding a lot of sodium. So let's look at some of them. This is California Pizza Kitchen. I took these pictures myself. 870 milligrams of sodium. That's per slice, not the whole pizza. Uh, okay, now we get to McDonald's, okay? Now, you can cheat. You can have McDonald's once in a while, but the key, don't do it every day for lunch. 3,060 milligrams of salt. Where is it? Where's it hiding? Well, if you look at the picture, it's in the bacon. It's in the cheese. There's double cheese in that picture. Uh, it's actually in the bread, and it's in the meat. Uh, that one sandwich is 1,850 calories. Uh, the average adult, unless they're exercising, really doesn't need more than 2,500 calories. It has 106 grams of fat and 43 saturated fat, which is the bad fat. So you may look at that picture and say, boy, that looks delicious. And you may like the taste of it. The question really becomes how long do you want to live? I mean, honestly, and how long do you want to stay healthy? So once in a while, sure. Steady diet of this and um, you are really going to ruin your health. Uh, look at, so, so nobody ever eats just the hamburger. You add fries to it. See what the fries just added? Now remember, there was 3,000 milligrams of salt in the sandwich. You add the fries and you just added 266 milligrams. That's a lot. Here was a uh, TV dinner I saw, Thai-style coconut chicken, 860 sodium. Uh, chicken portobello ravioli, 930 milligrams of salt. Remember again, you only need three grams, basically. So you, there are alternatives. Uh, here's a chicken broth that has fat-free, no MSG, 33% less sodium. That's the only thing we buy. Not necessarily that brand, but if we're going to make a soup at home, we always buy less sodium and fat free. Um, I'll talk about sugar. Uh, this is one that, I, you know, you're always stepping on somebody's toes because we seem to be in our culture wired for sugar. Um, uh, my son noticed when he got older, he's 43 today, that all the pictures of him as a child, he seemed to be holding this cookie in his hand. In Italian, it's called a biscotti. You've probably had it. It's kind of like a hard cookie. Of course, it has sugar in it, and we use it as a pacifier. So if he was moody or bored, we would just give him a cookie. Well, uh, he noticed that and said, why were you always giving me a cookie? Well, it kind of kept him sedated. Um, but you see, we've turned Halloween into a, a really a very unhealthy holiday for children. Uh, you, can, you can have as much candy as you want on Halloween. You can go door to door, you can go to your church, a trick or trunk or trick or treat. Well, uh, in the long term, um, candy and sugar is not good for you. You only need 25 to 30 milligrams of sugar per day. That is seven teaspoons. Seven teaspoons is all the sugar you need all day. Um, what can refine sugar? High fructose, corn syrup. By the way, if you see those in the ingredients and they're the first 
top two or three ingredients, it means it's just loaded. It can add to diabetes. By the way, sugar doesn't cause diabetes, but, but it can help the onset of it. And certainly once you have it, you can get dangerously high levels of glucose. It can lead to heart disease, obesity, cancer, and it can compromise the immune system. Now look at the picture. You may like Cheetos, you may like Oreos, Doritos, Chip Ahoy's. You may, people will tell me, I prefer Coke and Pepsi, but not the diet. Once again, uh, try to get used to, um, you know, using the artificial sweet. Now the, 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 the doctors are still out on whether or not the substitutes are healthy. You know, is Splenda good? Is a Stevia good? You know, I, I hear all sorts of things. I go back to moderation. You know, if you're using 40 packs of Splenda a day, probably not good because once again, it's kind of a chemical. Um, I don't know if you know this, but saccharin, which was the first sweetener when I was a kid back in the 50s, and it has the same substance that's in uh, um, some of our sweeteners like Equal that we use, is actually potash. You heard me correctly. Potash is a derivative of coal. <laughs> and one day in a lab, they simply found it was sweet. Now they put it in. So once again, consider what you put in your body, uh, in some cases, is a chemical. So people will tell me, oh, have you ever tried Dublin Black Cherry or, or Coke? Uh, 38 milligrams of sugar. I saw a drink the other day. I was in the store, and it was a mango and pineapple juice connect, uh, combination. And I was thirsty. And I thought, oh, I love, I love mangoes, and I, and I love the flavor of mango juice. And I picked up the bottle, and it had 58 grams of sugar. I did put it back. But you've got to read those labels. The body only needs 25 to 30 grams. Look at a Pepsi without uh, artificial sweetener. 58 grams of sugar. That's a lot. That's a lot of sugar. Uh, I, years ago, I was doing the Frappuccino because I don't know why I thought it was healthy. You know, you go to Starbucks and you have a cup of coffee and then they put it in these little bottles. And I thought, well, I could start out with one in the morning and that would just give me an extra edge and it would pep me up. Well, in reality, um, there were 290 calories in the little Frappuccino bottle, but look, 46 grams of sugar and 160 grams of salt. And you were thinking, well, there's no salt in coffee. Well, that's why we read the labels. Uh, Red Bull, you know, especially among young people, these energy dr drinks have become a, a way of a shortcut. Like if you deprive yourself of sleep, you take the energy drink, but look at the content. 27 grams of sugar, 105 grams of salt, 80 milligrams of caffeine. The limit, the recommended limit for teenagers is 100. Uh, the limit of caffeine for adults is 400. I know people who drink coffee all through the day. Well, more than four cups of coffee can make you irritable and nervous and restless. My brother-in-law, uh, before the COVID, worked in Hollywood, and he started to notice that on the floor of the sound stages were discarded little five energy drinks that uh, the various crew were taking these little shots of energy drinks, which is just filled with caffeine. One time I was speaking in a high school, public high school, and there was actually a, uh, a vending machine that dispensed, uh, a, a, it was a drink called Bolt or Zolt. I think, I think it was Zolt. I could have been Bolt. Anyway, it said twice the sugar, twice the caffeine. And I was a little tired. I was going to speak in 20 minutes. I thought, boy, this, this might be really good. Now, understand, this was in a vending machine in a high school. So the high school students were taking this. Twice the sugar, twice the caffeine. So I, I took it. I'm not sure if I took two of them. I, I could have been. Uh, so here's what happened. And nothing really happened. You know, they introduced me. I started speaking. And then it kicked in. And I was like a wild rabbit. I, I, I started talking faster and faster. I started slurring my speech. Um, I think I was blinking as I was talking. Uh, not, you know, short-term moderation, yes, uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, you don't need twice the caffeine and you don't need twice the sugar. So if you owned a beautiful car like a, a Lamborghini, uh, would you be careful what you would put in it? What kind of gas? Of course you would. You'd be very careful. Uh, would you put the lowest quality gasoline if you had a $100,000 car? Of course not. You would put the very best gasoline. So that's my, that's kind of my metaphor. That's my analogy. 
why wouldn't you put the best organic foods in your body because you only got one body? Uh, look again at the difference. Um, there's a diet lemonade that only has two, two, two grams of sugar and no sodium. The Smucker's sugar-free orange marmalade, which to me tastes just as good as the sugar stuff on toast, zero sugar, zero sodium, zero fat. Good. Now, this is the dangerous one, and I'm going to really step on toes here. I know we're not going to movies right now because of the COVID, but when the movie, the movie theaters are open again, but when you go back, what's the first thing you smell when you go through the door? Well, you smell the popcorn. You know they do that on purpose. They pop the popcorn right in front of you because, in a sense, you become addicted to the smell. I know I have over the years. And what do they have? They have this push button where you can put your own toppy on it. Do you notice it doesn't say the word butter? It says the word topping. So it's artificial butter. Uh, I cannot do that. Um, the truth is, when I, I, I'm really watching TV, I mean movies at home, but if I go to the movie theater, I have to totally resist uh, doing their popcorn because they put tons of tons of salt on it. Look at that real big bucket. And then if you add uh, a lot of fluid, I have to call it fluid because I don't think it's even butter. Um, you can, with a big bag of popcorn or a bucket, have 1,628 calories, 15 milligrams of salt, 583 saturated fat, and 488 of the bad cholesterol. Once a year, twice a year, fine. If you do it frequently, very harmful. So I recommend things like Skinny Pop. There's a lot of popcorns where if you look, zero sugar, um, now there are, there are some ingredients there too. Again, read the ingredients, or even in when it says natural flavors, sometimes the natural flavor really is a synthetic, it's a chemical. So it is important to read up. Um, I've tried these, <clears throat> um, these little cookies that uh, are very, very light, lightly sweet. sweet. Um, so here's my recommendation. I, I try to eat a salad about every other day. And you don't want to put thick, um, buttermilk ranch on it. You don't want to put um, chunky blue cheese. That's the worst one. Chunky blue cheese, if it's not dietetic, and Thousand Island are just saturated with sugar and some of the bad cholesterol. So here, here's a healthy meal, especially for lunch. And, and you know, it does, you can buy a head of lettuce for what? $1.50. And uh, so a salad with olive oil and vinegar, no bread, you got, you got to resist the temptation. Black pepper and no salt. Very, very healthy meal. And we had a lot of this when we went to Europe. Uh, I'd grow my own food, somebody said, if I could only find bacon seeds. Well, I in Chicago, there's this hot dog called Portillo's. If you've ever been to Chicago, to me, it's the best hot dog that I've ever had in the whole world. Do uh, you know what hot dogs are made of? If you like hot dogs, you don't want to know. <laughs> and this is true. I had a friend who had a ranch in Florida. And we would go to a, a, a slaughterhouse, and and uh, one day um, I asked him. I said, "What's in a hot dog?" To which he said, "Do you like hot dogs?" And I said, "Yes, I do." And he said, "Then I won't tell you." Well, you know, th this went on all day, and finally, at the end of the day, I I, I just wanted to know. And finally, uh, I said, "Okay, no, no, it's okay. I won't stop eating hot dogs. But tell me what's in them." And you won't see this because uh, you don't see me on screen but he pointed to his lips, his nose, his cheek, and his eyelids. <laughs> uh, he was basically saying that hot dogs are the scrap that's on the floor in a meat house. And if it comes from a, a pig or, or, or a, a beef cow, it's the parts that nobody else is going to eat. Uh, it is a sausage. Now it's ground up, but here's the dangerous part. The dangerous part isn't the meat part. In order for the sausage to be flavored, they put tons of salt in there. And so a sausage and a hot dog, I will tell you that when I fly into Chicago, I start salivating when the, uh, the pilot comes on and says, fasten your seatbelt, we're going in for our landing, because I start imagining that hot dog. And sure enough, I have mapped out where the closest Portillo's is to the airport, and I go straight there. Now, yes, I'm cheating, but I only do it once. And I do it because I'm, I'm in Chicago. Uh, their hot dogs, by the way, are loaded. Uh, it's got relish and onions, and this is kind of a Chicago dog. Um, and it's got a hot pepper, if you like hot peppers, and then the poppy seed bun. Control cheating. 
Okay, it doesn't mean that you can never have cake again. It doesn't mean you can't have a hot dog, but you just have to do it in moderation. Now, uh, been to a Dunkin' Donut lately? Uh, yeah, from time to time, I like a Dunkin' Donut. I have to try to stop at one. Look at that center picture. That is a d donut frosted with sugar covered with M&Ms. Uh, wow, that's kind of like a heart attack waiting, waiting to happen, isn't it? Now, you're not going to do that every every day. But um, years ago in my home church, and I'm going back like, oh, I'm thinking 15 years ago, uh, we, we had a donut Sunday in which we had a table and there was coffee and then there were boxes of donuts and, and they were free. There was a little offering plate if you wanted to give money. And uh, so as I started doing these seminars, I suggested that we do uh, something a little bit different, that we have a vegetable Sunday. We replace the donuts with, with the uh, vegetable trays, uh, to which the reaction was not very good. <laughs> there are a lot of people who just can't stand the notion of salary. Uh, what they will say is, I love salary as long as it's covered with peanut butter. Um, but again, you know, you can, you can dip cauliflower or broccoli in a, a, a diet dressing or olive oil. Um, exercise, important one. Exercise. I thought you said extra fries, <laughs> someone once said. Uh, walking, one of the most healthy forms of exercise. And it doesn't have to be, well, fast walking is healthier than slow walking but you don't have to run. But if you're at that point in life where your joints are bothering you and you've got a, maybe a problem with your knees or hip, um, the, the other really great one in addition to walking uh, is swimming. But if you look at this list, uh, golf, uh, you know, you, you don't stay in the cart forever and walking around golf is good for you. Uh, boating, I mean, you're walking around the boat, I presume. Uh, gardening is really healthy for you. Sightseeing, I mean, travel, traveling is really a healthy thing because you're, you're walking. Um, I, I had a relative once who, who went to uh, Rome and he purchased, he didn't buy it, but he rented a golf cart and never walked anywhere. Well, you know, that's kind of, and there was some obesity in the family. So obviously that uh, was, was not healthy. Swimming is a good exercise. This is my favorite exercise. I love to swim. Remember, I didn't learn until I was in my 40s, but uh, there's, uh, there's pools all over Grand Prairie. Uh, whatever town you're in, there are beautiful pools. The summit has a nice, I think it's Olympic sized pool. And uh, a pool doesn't have to be deep to be good exercise. Uh, and you, know, you, you can do laps. And this is not actually the one at the summit, but it's similar. There was this round pool, which I love, and it's a resistance pool. You walk against a current and you don't float. Uh, by the way, there is a sign that says you walk in a certain direction, which is against the current. And if you're in that pool, you got to walk. I have encountered people who just seem to float. It's not meant to be a pool. And usually when the, when the lifeguard sees it, they tell them to leave. Now, I have the word ladies recipe up there because this is kind of a funny story. About two years ago, I'm in this pool and uh, there were three ladies uh, and uh, they were they were half floating and half moving, but they had this wonderful discussion. They were talking about one of their favorite foods. Now understand, I'm exercising, which I presume they were doing too. And they were talking about a hamburger that they uh, would make and eat that I had never heard of in my entire life. Uh, here was the ingredients, because they said it out loud. You started with a half a pound of Chuck Burger. By the way, I'm not recommending this. You stuff the burger with blue cheese. Wow. You put four slices of thick bacon on it, one slice of American cheese, fried onion strips, <laughs> then one poached egg. This is all real. You add liberally salt and pepper, and you put it on buttered Texas toast. Uh, wow. That is another prescription for um, bad health. And it amused me. It amused me because... They were, I thought, exercising, but, but talking about this, this great meal they were going to have. Somebody said, I tried a cartwheel the other day, thinking it was like riding a bike. It's not. There are certain things, like for me, uh, going up ladders, that you just stop doing. Well, we're coming close to the end. Uh, sun. Moderation, once again. Uh, you need sun for, to produce vitamin D. If you're not getting enough vitamin D, it's, it's important for uh, 
uh, for your bones, uh, you can take a supplement. Uh, you, and people don't always know this. If you're taking an anti antibiotic, it says it on the label, but people always, don't always read the labels. You have to avoid the sun. It's dangerous. Uh, I had a uh, basal cell carcinoma on an ear. Uh, they didn't scrape it off, by the way. They took a part of my ear off. They took a whole wedge out. My ears don't match, but most people don't, don't notice it. Um, skin cancer uh, can be, uh, when it spreads, when it gets in internal organs like melanoma, if you see anything that's an irregular shape or dark or black. I recently had a biopsy in my cheek. Doctor said it didn't look good. Um, took a biopsy, came back, and it was fine. But see, better to be on the side of uh, checking it out. If you don't have a dermatologist as you get older, good thing to do. By the way, sun damage is cumulative. That means if you were out at the beach when you were 15, and now you're 65 or 70, you can still get the damage. And I come from an age where we put baby oil on our face to get darker. And we put aluminum foil under our face, no suntan lotion, to get darker. We thought that made you look healthy. Also, if, if you don't like wrinkles, you don't want premature wrinkles, uh, be careful with the sun. Use sunscreen. And, and the higher the number, like uh, 40 and 50, means the more blockage, the more protection. Wear a hat, uh, especially protecting your ears and your um, in the back of your neck. I wear a baseball cap quite a lot when I'm outside, but see, it didn't protect my ears. And that's how I got the skin cancer on one of my ears. So it's okay to wear those big floppy hats. Uh, when you're near the equator, be careful. People just simply don't realize when they're in the, Medi in the Mediterranean or when they're in the Caribbean, if you're on a cruise, you're closer to the sun. I mean, you're at the equator. And on our honeymoon, we made a terrible mistake. We were on the island of Antigua, and at noon, we were laying without suntan lotion for several hours, getting sun. And then my, I don't think it was third degree, but my second degree burn, I mean, I was swollen and I, 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 I was feverish and I couldn't even be touched for the next two to three days, which is not good on a honeymoon. Avoid tanning beds. I, I'm not a great fan of them. Sunburn equals damage. Let me say that again. If you get burned and you take off a, a blouse or a shirt and you can see the difference between your skin that was protected and the skin wasn't, that's damage. And damage is not, is not good. So let's do a quick review before we're finished. Good nutrition. Look at labels. Eat uh, fresh fruit, fresh vegetables and fresh uh, fruits. Always good for you. Always healthy. When you can, it's a little more pricey, but if you can buy the stuff that uh, doesn't have pesticides on it, uh, then less chemicals that are going into your body. Um, adequate sleep, routine exercise, just keep moving, whatever form of exercise you're using, intellectual stimuli, stimulation. Um, if you like crossword puzzles, do crossword puzzles. Uh, if you enjoy reading, read. If you're a, a Christian or a church member, daily Bible reading periodic daily, daily prayer. Actually, all of this is really quite healthy for you. So once again, breathe deeply, walk fast if possible, or swimming, very good for you. Check your blood pressure often, if not daily. If you're a diabetic, check your blood sugar. Sufficient sleep. Don't ignore symptoms of pain. I have a little tiny pain right now. So what I do, I ignored the pain because I'm trying not to go out with the COVID, but that wasn't good because now I have uh, a need for drilling and hopefully nothing worse. Avoid added sugar. Use handrails and banisters in your house. I, I had a friend in my church who, who passed at the age of, I think she was 105 and was a school teacher most of her life. And she just led a very good lifestyle. A lot's hereditary. I know that. Uh, there are good genes and genes that aren't. We'll be friends till we're old and see now. Then we'll be new friends. <laughs> we'll meet again. Moderation. Control cheating. You don't have to run. You can balance work with play. Play is really important in recreation. Avoid stress and worry. And finally, let's come back to the COVID. I know you're probably tired of hearing of it, and I'm tired of wearing a face mask. But let's talk about that in a second. Wash your hands for at least 30 seconds. Someone once said, you sing happy birthday, and that's about 20 seconds. Well, I worked in a hospital many years ago. And I was a phlebotomist. I had to stick, uh, I, you know, I would draw blood. But for newborns, I would stick the heel of their feet 
and I'd have to get some blood and we'd have to check the what was called Billy room. Well, I, I treated these babies like I would treat my own child. And so I wasn't simply washing my hands. I was scrubbing under the nails. I had a little brush that would go under the nails uh, and I would just wash my hands for probably three minutes, four minutes uh, and with soap, of course. But I wanted to protect those babies. And so before the COVID, as, as, a, as a pastor, when I would visit hospitals, I'd wash my hands. There's always dispensers in the hall. I'd wash my hands before I'd go in the room. I would wash my hands after I came in the hall. I'd wash them going in the elevator. I would always have a little bottle of uh, antiseptic with alcohol in it. And I would uh, do that. I, I, you know, yes, your hands will dry out, but you can use lotion. Wear a face mask. Now, uh, you know, I, I'm going to make this really easy on everybody. Wearing a face mask is not a political statement. Not wearing a mask in support of the president is not smart. I don't know how this thing became political. Why do you wear a mask? You wear it for other people. Uh, they're saying that this virus is so, so tiny that it can probably get through the average face mask. But what you're avoiding is, um, is strong talking and coughing and sneezing. Because the thing that is the most contagious are the droplets. So you wear a face mask for someone else. A couple of days back, somebody came up to me without a face mask and was talking to me and I kept backing up. But see, I think it's rude because it's not for you, it's for the protection of the other person. And you know, our healthcare workers, even though they're wearing a face shield and gloves, many of them have gotten very sick and many of them have died at this, at this time. Don't shake hands. You know, maybe we're rethinking everything we've, we've done. We used to make fun of the Japanese for wearing a mask on a subway. We've all seen pictures of that. Japanese uh, all over the streets wearing a face mask. Well, maybe we should have learned something that, that it really, I know we're tired of the face mask, but maybe in the future, we're gonna have to do it more. And may, maybe shaking hands was never really very healthy. Um, I will tell you something, you're all adults on this, that over the years with all the travel I did, I can't speak for women, but when I was in the men's restroom in an airport, I would see men, including flight attendants and pilots who would do their business in the bathroom and then walk right out without going past the sink. Is that, is that a kind of a horrible concept? Well, I saw it. It wasn't an official sur survey, but see, I don't know about the women. I think they're more hygienic than men, but we have not always had the best habits when it comes to health. So maybe the handshake in the future is something that, unless we're really sure that people are taking care and, and washing their hands frequently. Right now, hugs are something that we can't really, really do. Um, you see, even talking, when you're talking, especially if you're talking loud, I'm sure as I'm looking at this computer screen, something is coming out of my mouth and it's going on the screen. It, 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 maybe you can't even see it, but my pulmonologist said to me in a video conference a couple of weeks ago, you've got to understand that when we say recovery from COVID, you got to define the word recovery. He said, it, he said, for a lot of people, it simply means you didn't die, but he has seen people with 50% reduced lung capacity. People who after the COVID who are young are getting strokes and heart attacks. We don't see the word, the, the final word is not in. We used to think COVID was only for older people with underlying conditions. Definitely, they're the highest risk. But there are stories of people who've gotten the COVID and they were 30 and they were 40 and they died. And there was a famous story of a, of a COVID party. I forget what state that was, where all the young people, they were college age, went to the party to, without masks, without social distancing, to see who could get the COVID first. And the first one was the winner. And this one guy got it. And then he, uh, he texted everybody and said, it's a lot worse than I thought. And you know what, my friends, he died. Wow, what, what a stupid game, game wasn't it? Um, so it is highly contagious. I have little alcohol bottles with me at all time. I have them in my pocket. I got them in my briefcase. And they have to be alcohol-based. And the higher the alcohol content, the better. And right now, I would still say, uh, limit your outside trips. 
Um, I went to Art Taco the other day because they had a seating area outside. And so I sat outside. I'm not really ready for inside dining yet. I, I definitely want to support small businesses. I want to support our restaurants. If you go to a restaurant and, and they're practicing social distancing, um, but again, if you have diabetes, if you have underlying conditions, um, you just may want to you know, pick up that meal. You're supporting the business by still purchasing something. I went to Jimmy John's yesterday, picked up sandwiches for my wife and I, but I wasn't going to eat in, inside. Uh, a little gray hair is a small price to pay for all that wisdom. Well, I got some gray hair, but I've also lost some hair too as well. Well, this is the end of our, uh, our time together. And uh, I, I just want to thank you for tuning in. And, and I hope these, uh, these were help, helpful. Uh, as, you, as you probably noticed, most of what I've talked about is really just common sense, isn't it? Um, you know, if, if, you, if you have a pain and it persists and it's strong, call a doctor. Um, some people will go on the internet and become their own doctor. Uh, that has a downside. And I'll tell you what the downside is. First of all, you, you will think sometimes if you look on the internet, things will appear worse than they are. So like everybody will think they have cancer because they have a certain symptom. There are things that really aren't that serious, but unless you have a blood test or unless you have a doctor's checkup, uh, you, won't, you won't really know. So, so you have to be alert. You gotta be tune, attuned and listen to your own body. And remember this key factor, moderation. Moderation, why? Excess in anything is not good. Now, have I told you in this session you can never have cake again? No, I didn't say that. Did I say you could uh, never um, have uh, a piece of birthday cake or for instance, uh, uh, have popcorn or you can put some butter on the popcorn? No, I didn't say that. What I said was moderation, simply meaning um, control cheating. Maybe you do it for a grandchild's birthday party, but you don't do it on a regular basis. Um, we know that obesity will lead to uh, very, very poor health. And then see certain kinds of conditions will lead to other conditions. So, so the key here, I love the word moderation, good nutrition, exercise, um, the big one in our American culture is reducing stress. It really is because we don't always realize that long-term stress has an effect on, on the body. So I have completed my presentation and I hope you've enjoyed it. And I'm back. Thank at, you, Don. Back with Jacqueline again. Yes. Appreciate you. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, we will see you at our next presentation. We do appreciate you coming in and volunteering for us. Um, it's always a privilege. Just like always a privilege. Well, we appreciate it. Can you tell everybody, is this going to be available as a recording and how do they find it? Yes. Yeah, so um, we actually just got our um, editing software. Usually I'm going to um, take some time, edit the videos, and it'll be like a week or two depending on other programs that get posted but it'll be found on our grand fun youtube page okay. and if you want to send me an email i can send you that link great. um and it's going to be on our facebook page as well sounds great thank you jacqueline thank you guys y'all have a good one Thanks. happy friday yes happy friday <laughs>